Welcome back everyone, you guys seem to really enjoy part 1, so here's part 2 of the unintentionally creepy media iceberg created by Night Owl 19 We will be covering layers 3 and 4 today, and if you haven't watched part 1 yet, I will link that below. And two final notes before we begin, I did skip over a few entries that I didn't find remotely creepy, that way we can get to the better entries. And some of these topics cover sub 10 second clips, making for very few talking points, which obviously means some entries are going to be very very short, especially if you're coming from the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg videos. Now, without further ado, let's begin. This animation was shown after the credits of shows such as Rugrats, Wild Thornberries, and Rocket Power. Unfortunately, I had to remove the audio from this clip as it would be copyrighted if I included it. But the audio simply says Klasky Chupo in a robot-like voice before being followed up by this sound and then some quacks. Now before anyone tries and corrects me on how I pronounce this, depending on which version of the clip you watch, the word would be either pronounced as Supo or Chupo. This logo would go through many changes throughout the years. The ones that predate the one that you just saw didn't even include the grotesque looking face. The newer ones that Nickelodeon would create would adjust the audio from the robot voice to a normal human voice, still saying Klasky Supo or Chupo, whichever you prefer. <laughs> Eventually, Nickelodeon would completely scrap the face being part of the logo and instead have a rising sun lighting up a city with a chicken calling out. But this would not mark the end of the Klasky Chupo mascot. Around 2016, there would be a web series titled Robo Splat that focuses on the robot found in the Klasky Chupo logos. The Klasky Chupo mascot would be self-aware, saying that people have been scared of him for years. Winston Jeeves is the butler of Lara Croft that can be found in various Tomb Raider games. Many players would either get annoyed with Winston's presence or just have a disliking of his appearance so they would lock him inside of the freezer in the kitchen. The game was originally released in 1997 and if you recall in part 1 we did have an entry going over old video game graphics as well. The various hardware limitations would create situations where your mind twists things to become more creepy than they actually are. For example, many games would feel barren due to the inability of the consoles to display a lot of objects and people at once. And oftentimes these older games would not include music or ambient noise, which highlighted the sounds created by your footsteps, further amplifying the feeling of isolation in these games. Me and My Friends was the name of the live action Backyardigans pilot episode. The one that aired was a standard episode using the 3D models that everyone is familiar with, and then the other was a live action rendition where actors put on suits of the various characters. However, the second version is sort of lost media at this point in time. It was originally aired as a compilation of sorts and only 3 seconds of it was shown. Furthermore, the clip was aired around 1998 and what we would come to know as Backyard Against Today would air in 2004. These suits, just like many other old mascot costumes, are a bit unsettling, and apparently this series was intended to be named Me and My Friends before the name Backyard Against was even proposed. I should also mention that the 3 second clip doesn't even have any audio associated with it, and to this day we still don't have any additional footage of the actual episode, but the iceberg did provide some additional photos that were taken of the cast members. Source is the game engine that is used by various games such as Portal, Gmod, and Half-Life 2 just to name a few. Many people who play games that use the Source engine report their experience to be kinda creepy when the action and music begins to fade away. The gentle ambiance and music creates an unnerving environment. The quiet portions of these games would cause people to constantly be on edge preparing for a sudden scare. Games such as Gmod and Half-Life 2 are often filled with large spans of silence and isolation which create an experience otherwise not present in a largely populated game. Albeit not a source game, a large reason those creepypasta games are so creepy is the sense of loneliness that it leaves you with. The 
The following program is rated TV MAL. It contains strong language and is intended only for mature audiences. This entry refers to the various TV ratings that will play before a movie that is intended for adults. I actually have never heard any of these audio clips before and have only seen the graphics that come up before movies. But many people report that they find the voice as well as the nature of being advised not to watch something unsettling. These audio recordings are actually intentionally made to be a tad intimidating slash scary in order to dissuade any children or sensitive adults from viewing the incoming content. I love the Mr. Meaty show, but I can totally understand why these characters would be looked to as creepy. The show was eventually cancelled due to the low ratings as it was made for a slightly more mature audience, but instead was aired with shows that a younger audience would view. For those of you who have never heard of Mr. Meaty, it was a show on Nickelodeon during the late 2000s. The show focused on two teenage boys working at a fast food restaurant where bizarre and grotesque scenarios would play out. One of the more notorious episodes involved the duo frying a customer's hand and then showing the wrinkly burnt dark flesh of the puppet. Another episode involved a freezer that one of the main characters would mistake as an indoor outhouse. Parker Dinkelman would take a look inside to see a creepy looking frozen body. I never saw this episode as a child, but this face definitely would have ruined my sleep. But the episode that most of you may recall is the tapeworm one. Parker would have a tapeworm yanked out of him with a fishing rod by Josh before they ultimately found someone to buy the worm. This buyer would then voluntarily let the worm inside of his body. The show really was just crazy and I definitely want to rewatch it when I get the chance. Clanker is a large aquatic creature from Banjo-Kazooie that resembles a shark. Most of Clanker's body is made of metal, but he still has some organic bits remaining as you can see open wounds around his midsection. So many children hated this part of the game, not just because of Clanker's design, but the area has an unsettling ambiance with the flesh-like coloring to the spinning blades. And if you're like me who hates the ocean, it doesn't help that this level is taking place underwater. The player is tasked with freeing Clanker from his restraints by turning an underground key and once he's free, you can enter Clanker through his blowhole. This entire section is just so weird to have in a rated E game. If you've never played the game before and you saw this level, I wouldn't blame you for thinking that it was actually a creepypasta version of the game. Oh boy, another entry that has to do with the fucking ocean. Oh my god, I hate the water so much. Echo the Dolphin is a video game that was released in 1992. It has you playing as a dolphin traversing through various underwater labyrinths. If you've ever played the old school Sonic games, Echo the Dolphin's physics are somewhat similar where if you don't have a decent understanding of it, you'll find yourself awkwardly crashing into your environments and enemies that lie before you. The game is riddled with sharks, pufferfish, whatever the fuck this thing is, crabs, octopi, and get this, aliens. At some point, this game just takes a turn into some bizarre Lovecraftian adventure and has you facing off against this xenomorph looking thing. Tough to believe that this game is actually rated E. First off, I want to say that this entry will have some minor spoilers for the game Gone Home, so if you want to play the game, please skip forward. Gone Home is a first person video game where you play as a woman named Katie. You're encouraged to explore as much as possible and from the gameplay you're watching, you may think that this is some sort of horror game, but it actually isn't or at least not in the traditional sense. There's no demonic creature chasing you and you can't even die in this game. Players would venture through the dark and unfamiliar mansion expecting to find the typical scare seen in other games. Players would tense up every time they open a door and turn a corner just to find nothing. And for a brand new person who knows nothing about the game, each time they would not be scared, they would grow increasingly anxious expecting a scare to come eventually. But it never does. You as the player return to an abandoned mansion owned by your family, but upon entering you find that the house is completely empty which creates a feeling of dread where you don't know if something is hiding in the shadows. Again, this isn't a traditional horror game and isn't labeled as one, but the setting created by the developers makes it an unintentional psychological horror game. The name of the entry pretty much explains what this is. At points in Assassin's Creed Unity, an NPC's face will bug out and only leave the eyes and teeth, creating this creepy looking face.
At first, I had a tough time understanding this entry as most threads and conversations I came across on this topic said the game was overall good and an underrated gem even. Nothing about it being creepy. But then I stumbled across this video. Being a Nintendo game, Yoshi's Story was mainly marketed towards children and you wouldn't expect the game to have designs like this or this. The unintentionally creepy part of the game pretty much all came from the art design. Despite being a cute and upbeat game, almost every stage had a freaky looking creature like this bat thing. In the video created by Tall Fox, he brings up a pretty cool theory. The game focuses on baby Yoshis, which are yet to develop their cognition of the world around them. And because of this, the creatures in the game appear creepier than they actually are to show us what these babies are seeing. Most of you likely remember this chimp after the credits of Jimmy Neutron, but I actually don't remember this animation having multiple variations. Along with the lone monkey saying, I'm Paul, there's also one with two of them saying, we're Paul, as well as a Spanish Paul and a couple versions where Paul forgets his lines. And something cool that I never noticed until this iceberg, the palm trees are actually DNA and then the shrubs in front of Paul are actually molecules. When I first clicked the link to this entry, I was left a little bit confused as to why this is even remote remotely creepy, but after some brief searching, I found some older versions of this ending animation and oh my god. Yep, I can definitely understand why this would be creepy. Just like the chimpanzee animation, there's multiple variations of this one as well. One where this animal blows up, another where that same animal can be seen holding the head of this person, but I find this one with the three portraits to be the most unsettling. Dating back around two decades now, Nintendo hired a composer named Kazumi Totaka to create secret tunes that will pop up in various Nintendo video games. In the 1992 Mario Paint game, if you click the O on the title screen, the letters would scatter and then a new background track would begin playing. Another example is in Animal Crossing with a character called KK Slider. If you look at the Japanese version of the name, it comes out to be Tota KK, paying homage to Kazumi. You can request that KK play Totaka's song and of course the track would begin. There are numerous other examples where you can trigger the song and depending on who's listening, they might find the slow and empty rhythm to be slightly off-putting, especially when the song is triggered in an empty location or an end screen such as the Virtual Boy Wario Land game. Around 2003 to 2004, Quiznos launched an odd series of commercials starring these so-called sponge monkeys. These sponge monkeys can only be described as a deformed rat-like creature with grotesque looking eyes and gaping mouths. One of them could be seen playing the guitar in the background while the other is screaming out some lyrics urging the viewer to visit Quiznos. These little rodents would be created by a man named Joel Vitch and for whatever reason he would think that these would serve as the perfect mascot for Quiznos. This commercial is just downright strange but hey I guess the commercial did his job as it got people to talk about just how out of place commercial felt. BND aka VID is a TV production company based in Russia that was created in 1990, most famously known for shows such as Wait For Me and Pol Chudes. I probably destroyed that, but basically the latter show was a Russian version of Wheel of Fortune. The founder was a man that went by this name, and I'm just going to refer to him with his initials as VL cause I'm just gonna butcher his full name. VL would visit the Museum of Eastern Art in Moscow one day and see the head of a Chinese philosopher and just like to create of the sponge monkeys, for whatever reason, he found this creepy object to be appropriate to act as a company logo. At first, the museum would not allow him to use the original mask design, so he would commission his own. This logo animation really is just messed up for kids. 
The fast paced chugging sound at the start followed by the music is already horrendous but in case all of that was not enough to terrify children, the sequence would end on this uncanny mask facing the viewer. And I'd like to end this entry with an interesting fact about the creator. In 1995, VL would be shot dead on the stairs of his apartment building, but the killer would not take any of the valuables or cash that was on him. This would lead to an enormous public outcry and media outlets would begin to theorize that VL's death was a political or business related assassination. This entry refers to the You Cannot Beat Us NES commercial promoting the console and various video games such as Super Mario Bros and Duck Hunt. The commercial originally aired in the 80s and while it may have looked revolutionary at the time, it is now looked to as unsettling and inappropriate when it comes to marketing a console for children. The robot voices and the music in the background both work in tandem to create an uncomfortable viewing experience. The commercial can be interpreted in a couple of ways as well, either as a challenge for the player or Nintendo saying that no other gaming competitors can beat them. Punch Gushers with a taste that's gonna drive you fruity. It's very, very different and totally appealing. It's new Fruitomic Punch Gushers, the fruit snack bursting the juicy fruit punch in the middle. In 1991, Fruit Gushers would be introduced as a Betty Crocker fruit snack and instantly became a hit with kids. If you remember from part 1, there was an entry about Airheads commercials and the premise here is more or less the same. A boy takes out a pack of Gushers and after eating one, his head would turn into a blueberry. The same result would happen to two other children who eat the Gushers, but the banana one is probably the weirdest followed by the blueberry. The commercial would end with the banana saying, man I gotta split, which obviously is corny as fuck, but the animation in the mouth is just very strange here. In 2001, the game Luigi's Mansion would be released on the GameCube in the US and Japan. If you have never played the game before, I'll provide a short bit of background info. Luigi arrives at a mansion in search of Mario who is now missing. Luigi, wielding a flashlight and specialized vacuum, would have to fight his way through the malevolent ghosts that reside in the dilapidated building to find Mario. Upon quote unquote dying in game, you would be greeted with a good night screen that will promptly fade to black before transitioning into this game over screen that you are now seeing. We can observe a depressed looking Luigi seemingly lost of any hope in finding Mario with thunder in the background. I find this more sad than creepy and while the game is still targeted for a younger audience, I don't know if I would call this unintentionally creepy as the game is obviously taking place in an eerie setting with ghosts and such. In the Night Garden is a British live-action children's series produced by Ragdoll Productions. The show would consist of a large cast of colorful characters who live in a magical forest and each of these characters would speak in short and repetitive phrases. Similar to the Coco Melon entry in part 1, I don't find this series all that creepy, but some adults that watch their children viewing this show would call it unsettling. The creepiest thing about this show, if I had to choose something, would probably be the character designs, specifically the eyes. One of the characters is called Iggle Piggle, and I'm just not a fan of the sunken look around the eyes. Another character named Maka Paka also has some creepy looking eyes featuring those dark rings, and something about Maka Paka that's pretty funny and I guess inappropriate for children is when it's saying its own name. It sounds almost like motherfucker instead of Maka Paka. There's an article that shares 16 examples of why the show is quote unquote creepy but after going through them all, the examples don't do that good of a job arguing for the show being creepy. Instead, the creator of the article just seems to be overthinking everything about the show and trying to sell the idea that the producers are intentionally sexualizing the show. Gee. Me on Scrabbly. Chuck a doobie! Doubly Chuck a doobie! Pop Swabble! Oh, toy! 
Yodel Yum and Choco Scrum with multi pop pop dies. Oh, Grubbly! <laughs> Me Scrubble now. Snuggle. Whee! Kinder is a chocolate brand that originally found popularity in the German and Italian markets before also being sold in the US. But in 1997, Kinder eggs specifically would be banned in the US due to the small toy that is hidden within the chocolate egg. Today we are discussing the creepy Humpty Dumpty mascot that Kinder used to promote the brand to children. The commercial takes place on a wall with Humpty Dumpty, but instead of the porcelain-like shell appearance, this version of Humpty Dumpty would have flesh resembling a human. His face would also be very human-like, with tiny eyes, a mouth, and huge ears, making the character all the more creepy. This depiction of Humpty Dumpty seemingly speaks in gibberish, with only a few words being discernible. Upon shaking and ripping the egg open, Humpty Dumpty would yell out, Chaka Doobie, as he showed us the contents inside. The ad would finally end with him saying, Me Scrabble now, before he intended intentionally falls off of the wall. After some time, this ad would be pulled as complaints from parents would begin building up saying that the commercial was scaring their children. I'll try and make this entry short as it's been discussed by many YouTubers over the years. The Cursed Kleenex ad is an infamous commercial from the 1980s and depicts a woman and a red-skinned baby with a horn sitting together on a bed of hay. While the woman is seen interacting with the child, the song It's a Fine Day would play in the background. The entire setting that is being built here is very eerie and seems immensely out of place for a Kleenex commercial. This ad would be the subject of many popular urban legends, including one where everyone who is involved with the commercial would die. But of course, this was just all a hoax. Ten Toy is an animated short film by Pixar from 1988 that has a runtime of about five minutes. The short film focuses on a one-man band toy named Tinny, who is attempting to escape from Billy the Infant. Obviously, being from the late 80s, I wouldn't expect the animation to look amazing, but the movements in this short film make the Billy character all the more creepy. Billy's actions are supposed to be scary, at least from the point of view of the toy, but the dead-eyed infant is unsettling in a way that Pixar didn't intend. The way the facial features are configured just make the baby look so evil. This entry refers to one of the many bumpers that Adult Swim would use. As we discussed in part 1, Adult Swim would use multiple bumpers that are oddly disturbing to try and deter children from viewing the more mature shows that they would air. However, those bumpers could be seen as intentionally creepy and had distinct characteristics that made viewers uncomfortable. But I can't say why exactly the music that plays alongside this warning is creepy. Nevertheless, there are many people that will say this track makes them uncomfortable. And you're probably asking yourself why I haven't played the actual audio yet. Well, unfortunately, I was testing out some clips just to see if they would get copyrighted, and of course, this one did get copyrighted, so I will leave a link for it in the description if you do want to give it a listen. Nickelodeon has gone through dozens upon dozens of bumpers throughout the years, but one that has stuck out in many viewers' memory is the pinch face bumper from 1997. The animation featured a floating pair of eyes with glasses, some teeth, and a bow tie singing in front of a colorful background. The flashing lights paired with the jarring appearance of the mascot caused many children to fear this bumper, but I gotta say, the audio paired with this is actually really catchy. So this entry is definitely more weird than creepy in my opinion and I was debating on whether or not to even include it as it seems really out of place on this iceberg. Kay Foria is an artist that creates pieces focusing on famous cartoon characters such as Panini from Chowder, various Sonic characters, and many more. The illustrations would focus on these characters swallowing people whole and then having these comically large stomachs. Again, this entry seems pretty out of place on this iceberg and seems more like of a fetish thing and hey, if that's what you're into, whatever, does me no harm.
Capri Sun Respect the Pouch commercials were probably my favorite to come across back in the day. These commercials would tell kids not to do something, but of course, telling a child to not do something only encourages them into doing it. These ads would have children drinking a Capri Sun, and upon finishing it, they would fill the pouch with air before stepping on it. This action would result in the person blowing up or having their appearance completely altered, amongst other things. Later into this advertisement campaign, the disrespectoids would be introduced, which is basically a roster of animated characters that were once normal, such as Leaky Louie, Bobblehead Fred, and my personal favorites, Deltoid Donnie. Pui Pui Mokar is a stop motion short film, but at a surface glance, it seems like nothing but pure comedic absurdity. In this world, cars are replaced by living, breathing guinea pigs with minds of their own. And from most articles slash reviews I could find, the short film was a nice and wholesome experience. Albeit the humans that rode inside the guinea pigs were kind of strange, but regardless, overall, quite wholesome. However, one article would say that the show gave off feelings of existential horror. The guinea pigs in the film are clearly quite intelligent, even being compared to humans, despite not being able to speak. One episode has a group of bank robbers hijacking a guinea pig by pointing a gun at its head. This action would force the guinea pig to become an accomplice in the crime, leaving the hostage literally being scared shitless pooping out all the money that the robbers stole, leaving a trail for the police to follow. Again, I think the film is still overall cute more than anything else, but of course, fear is subjective and many people would call this show unusually dark. Let There Be Light is a level in the game known as Rugrats The Search for Reptar, which was released in 1998 on the PS1. During this level, the power would go out, leaving the home completely dark. You play as Tommy Pickles as he ventures around in the house looking for light. Throughout the level, you come across ghosts that can be thwarted with the use of your flashlight. The level is basically completely dark, which for most children is more than enough to cower in fear. But to top it all off, you also have this ominous music playing in the background. And it doesn't help that since this is an old game, the graphics are terrible and all the characters look absolutely terrifying. The best live tour ever was a play based on Disney's Phineas and Ferb. And while the costumes for Phineas and Ferb were accurate, they just look very uncanny, especially when Phineas opens his mouth to emulate lip syncing. Furthermore, some characters such as Baljeet, Candace, and Jeremy don't have complete costumes. Instead, they would just have the clothing and then goggles in place of actual headpieces. Then there's Dr. Doofenshmirtz, who's kinda just nightmare fuel. The only costume that actually looks good in my opinion is probably Perry. Thank you so much if you made it this far into the video, and if you enjoyed, leaving a like would really help me out, and if you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe as well. That being said, I'll talk to you all again very soon, and feel free to check out one of the videos on the side while I work on the next video.